as you can see, the title of this is pretty long, uh, Reliable Self-Service Application and Component Delivery with Universal Packages. It's a long title. Um, I could have just called it how you can do awesome stuff with universal packages. Probably would have meant the same. Um, but there you go. Um, so who am I, and why should you care what I have to say about this? Well, uh, my name is Greg Davis. I work basically as a developer at Adido for nine years, but since we're a small company, I've had a lot of different roles, mostly related to development, technical stuff. Um, I've worked on all of our products. I've done lots of coding for them. I've done testing. I've done support. I've probably interacted with some of you at tickets at some point or another. Uh, I wrote most of the Anito agent. I've done a lot of the feeds in ProGit. I did Otter Script Execution Engine. Um, all the like really nuts and bolts technical stuff. I know very well how it works because I wrote a lot of it. Um, so the topic of this though is universal packages. Um, if you're at Kevin's talk, you already he talked about packages to some degree. So this isn't really um, anything new. Uh, so, I mean, first, I'd like to say, what exactly is a package? Well, what makes it universal, and why does this help me? Of course, those are the questions that um, I'm hoping I can answer. So, a package. If we're talking about a physical package, what is it? It's like a box. Uh, you're shipping it somewhere. It's got stuff inside that you care about. It's got some kind of manifest that tells you where it's going, what's inside, well, what it's for, how valuable it is, etc. And it's got the physical container itself, groups everything together, keeps it safe, um, all pretty important. Uh, in software, it's exactly the same. That analogy actually works pretty well for once. Uh, the contents are just files. Maybe they're deployed. Maybe they're executed as scripts. It's got a manifest that says how the files are supposed to be used, where they're supposed to be used, and the container itself, something like a zip file. Uh, there's lots of different types of packages. There's developers type packages like uh, NuGet, NPM, uh, etc. They're language specific, and I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with those by now. They're just usually in, in the .NET world. They contain compiled code, and NPM they probably have JavaScript. Uh, the point is that they're consumed by the developer uh, during the development process. They're relied upon for builds, but after that they just become part of the build output, part of the artifact that's generated during the build. Um, we also have machine or software packages. Those are things like uh, Chocolatey, PowerShell, if you're configuring a system, if you're installing apps, components of an OS, and there's application or component packages, which is everything else. Uh, it's basically what I'm talking about today is third type only. And those are for packages that you may use in your applications, or you may deploy your applications using these types of packages. So why are packages good for any sort of development? Well, before we had them, what did we have to do? We had to install an SDK uh, on a build machine, on your local development machine. You had to make sure that SDK was the right version, the same one that would be used to build the product later, or you could get strange results you had to make sure any build machines or services that you're using to build has the right stuff installed. Uh, you also had the option of committing all your dependencies directly to something like Git. That would work fine until you have to update something and you don't know what relates to what. You have kind of a big mess. You could end up with a huge uh, uh, repository filled with all these binaries and nobody knows what they do over time. But at least it'll build the same everywhere. Um, packages solve both of those problems. Uh, it makes sure that your build's consistent no matter what you're doing, as long as you're pulling in the same packages everywhere, the same versions, you'll get the same output. Uh, packages themselves are self-documenting. They tell you more or less what they do, what they're for, how they're supposed to be used, um, what version they are, all the, what dependencies they have, all sorts of great stuff. Uh, NuGet, for example, all it really is is a zip file. It's got the manifest, which they call a new spec file. And it's XML, because that was kind of popular at the time. Not so much anymore, but there it is. Um, you can see all it really is, DLLs, binaries, and data about the package, of course. Ooh. 
So that's kind of how it is with all types of packages. There's content, manifest, that's it. Um, universal packages is exactly the same. Content, manifest, so what makes it universal? Does that mean I can put anything in it? Does that mean I can use it with NuGet and NPM and any type of package manager I want? Well, that's not really the same type of, that's not what we mean by universal in this case. It's more of that the package itself has, we could say, universal application. It's more of like an abstract package. It could be used for lots of different things, but it doesn't have a fixed platform or specific use case like NuGet, like developing software, like configuring a machine. Um, yeah, so what is it really then? Well, this is pretty much what we define universal packages. It's a format specification for the file itself. It's a repository specification for APIs that um, any sort of repository for these has to implement. And it's a registry, so you can tell what type of packages are installed, either on the system or in an application. Uh, the format for its, the package format for the file itself, simple, just like NuGet, there's a manifest file, and there's content. And that's almost, I mean, that's pretty much the same across the board for most package types. Uh, ours is a little bit different because we uh, put the content by convention beneath the package folder in a zip file so that anything that's not actually content can also be included. Uh, additional metadata, things of the sort, you can include at the root level. Inside that required manifest file, you have properties in JSON. Because again, that was kind of popular when we designed this format. So uh, nowadays, maybe it'd be YAML or something. But the idea is the same. Uh, in this, because it's universal, because it's abstract, and can apply in lots of different ways, the only two things that are required are name and version. And those are for ensuring that no matter what, a package can always be uniquely identified. And it can always be versioned. Uh, the version itself also has to follow semantic versioning too. It's because we wanted something strictly defined so you could always tell what the newest version of the package is. It's not as universal as if we just let you put anything in there, of course, but it's kind of a good trade-off, I think, because at least now there's firm rules that tell you what's new and what's a pre-release. Uh, there's other stuff in here too, obviously. There's lots of optional properties we define like a group that you can use for namespacing these. It's basically just part of a name. It's like a prefix, but you can add uh, slashes in it to indicate any sort of hierarchy or containerization, and that also is a unique identifier for it. It's really good for categorizing these. Uh, title is just like a friendly name for it. Description, pretty obvious. There's other things like icon that are included, but of course optional. And all of these we have specified, these and a few more. Uh, and there's a few interesting ones too on the bottom, the ones with the underscores. Those are not part of any specification. Uh, those are what we call custom properties. And custom properties are actually fully supported as well, in that you can add anything you want into this. Uh, we recommend putting underscores on the bottom just because maybe we'll add something later that would overwrite it. But, uh, that's just a recommendation. And those can be any JSON type or object. Like we have a string and an array here. And this is the metadata file for one of the packages that we use. And I'll get into that use case a little bit later. Uh, all right, so that's a package. Uh, a feed is what we call the uh, repository API for one of these. Uh, it's an open API. It's for listing, querying, and pushing packages, downloading. All that stuff's covered and documented on our website. It's uh, implemented, of course, by ProGet Universal Feeds. Uh, like out of the box, they're supported. They're, um, you don't have to use ProGet for these. They're pretty simple to implement. We made it so that you could implement even just a part of this if you only need some of the functionality. You don't want to configure a whole ProGet instance or do it all yourself. And we have a few client tools that natively understand this. Uh, UPAC EXE can work with this. Um, that's a tool we distribute. It's open source. There's upaclib.net. It's a .NET 
package on NuGet that can work with these feeds, can work with packages, automates a lot of this stuff for you. Uh, the universal package registry is another part. And that's really just a registry of installed packages. It's much like how machine packages always have something like this to tell what's installed. Uh, all it really is is a master list of packages. Um, we have definitions for well-known locations for this file for by machine, by user account, or any other custom place, like if you're using it for just an application scope or something like that. Uh, all it really is is a JSON file. It uh, keeps track of things like where the package was installed, uh, who installed it, uh, when it was installed, all that. And that also supports custom metadata, just like the package itself. Uh, these the package registry also includes a definition for how and where packages should be cached. If you want to, say, install one somewhere and keep a copy of the package around in some well-defined location. Um, using these, well, by themselves, it's pretty simple, although without a use case, it's, uh, it won't make a whole lot of sense yet, but I'll get into some more concrete examples. Uh, upack.exe, I already mentioned that, it's just a CLI, command line. Pretty simple to use, it does the basics like create, push, build, oh, or not build, um, download. I think you can maybe search feeds with it. Uh, upack, is this working? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Upacklib.net is, uh, sorry, <laughs> Upacklib.net is the uh, NuGet package I mentioned. And there's also Buildmaster, which has operations that uh, support things like creating a package, uh, ensuring it's installed somewhere, and so on. Battery generator. Lights still on. Bye, favorite y'all. Yeah, there we go. It's part of your game. OK. Excuse me. Okay, how's this? <coughs> okay. All right, so yeah, there's create package, ensure package, upload package, uh, built into Buildmaster to work with these also. Uh, what do these give you? Well, like packages for development or other things, they let you turn parts of your apps or things or um, services into things that are self-describing, things that can be deployed on their own. Uh, it gives you a repository where you can determine the state of all these, where you can download them, where you can push them, where you can secure them and add them to your backup solution. It gives you a registry of everything that's installed and kind of an audit history of when that happened. It gives you uh, a set of normal metadata, name, ID, group, that kind of thing, and anything else specific to your application that you don't add. It gives you a pretty consistent experience tooling for this. Uh, you can browse this stuff with ProGit as well as our other tools. And of course, when you're hosting with ProGit, you get all the other benefits of that, like using connectors to point to other feeds, uh, just as if they were part of the, uh, the local one. Uh, so that was all kind of abstract. Um, so I'm going to look at three use cases of how these actually improved something in real life. Of course, have to include ourselves. Uh, we used these uh, quite a bit. Um, I didn't always, it wasn't always that way though. I myself didn't really even get them at first. We had a lot of users actually ask for this and I didn't even understand it. I was like, well, why do you want this? This is just a zip file with, it, with you know, metadata in it. Why can't you just use NuGet or something? But um, in seeing how we were able to use these, uh, it, uh, it really clicked for me over time. So this is the, probably the, one of the earliest use cases of this was ourselves. So this one's relatively simple. Um, the little background is we have three major products, of course. Um, and we have these extensions for them. An extension is really just a plugin, uh, just a .NET DLL, essentially. And a lot of times we deliver functionality inside these. It makes it easier for us to update, fix bugs, uh, makes extensibility easier. 
and it has a lot of benefits because it adds kind of a hint of uh, microservice architecture to our products, which are otherwise kind of monoliths. Um, each product we have uses the same model for this, uh, and they're all versioned independently, but they all depend on the same common Anito SDK. But each product can get built against a different version of that SDK. So an extension may only load in, say, Buildmaster 6.1 or ProGit 5.2 or something like that, depending on what SDK that product supports. Uh, they're updated directly from the products via the uh, extensions page inside. Um, so before we used packages for these, or universal packages, we built them extensions for each product, and they each had their own release cycle. They were deployed using this own kind of custom service we hacked together on our public-facing website. It had a copy-pasted kind of pseudo repository for each product. And I put that in quotes, it was just a directory on disk with a SQL table. And each product had, because of the way we developed it, all the rules were slightly different for how these worked. Uh, we'd fix a bug in one, but then not fix it in the other two, and it would remain. So we had uh, quite a bit of problems with this over time, especially as we added more products. When it was just Buildmaster, not a big deal. Uh, at some point, we had the idea to turn these into universal packages. It's like, you know, we already have the solution to a service built into ProGit that works really well, that a lot of people use, and it returns all this information about these versioned zip files. Well, that's just like our extensions. Why don't we just put those in there? So we made a little custom command line tool uh, with our open source library that inspects our extension assemblies when they're built, generates that custom metadata and puts it in the upec.json file. And then we package those up and put them in ProGit. Uh, so we have one common feed now on anito.com for everything that's released. And we have like a pre-release channel at progit.anito.com. And we even do CI builds to that with these because we can get pre-release versions. And what you can do is inside Buildmaster, inside ProGit or Otter, you can just change the feed URL in there to point to any of these other repositories. And you get extensions from that source instead of the primary one. But because it's ProGit, we also have connectors set up in there, so you also get all the released extensions too. Uh, you can also do this with your own user-hosted feeds now because of this. People can develop their own extensions in-house. They can push them to their own private ProGit instance and then they show up on the Manage Extensions page for updates just like any of ours would. Uh, you know, also, we can see pretty easily what's the latest version now without looking in whatever table we had in SQL before. Just look inside ProGit. Uh, that's what it looks like in the front end side. Uh, you can see the obvious data, like the titles of packages are the name, descriptions are shown. Uh, it's Available extension is stuff that's pulled in from a feed. And update notices would be shown if there were any. Those also get pulled in from the feed. So basically, the, to take away this is by just converting these to pack universal packages, we get kind of off-the-shelf support for all these things. Uh, public pre-release, user-created repos, all that, without any additional work on our part. I mean, it's not the same for us because we also wrote ProGit, but, you know. <laughs> uh, we'll look at somebody else now, so it's not just Anito. Uh, there's a company called Silverfit, and this is a pretty interesting case. Uh, they have a, well, it's a multimedia system. It's written for people that uh, are kind of struggling with dementia. They're having trouble with their memory and so on. Uh, it's got a lot of multimedia resources. It lets them do things like uh, simulate walking down the street in, say, 1984 or something with all these photographs and it integrates with like an exercise bike type thing so that they can actually travel through uh, a street in different time periods to help bring back memories of events that happened before. There's lots of content to manage because of this because they have all these cities with all these pictures. They have localized text because they support languages all over the world. They've got all kinds of resources, gigabytes of stuff that goes into these. And 
they also occasionally have to update stuff. So before they used universal packages for any of this, everything was edited by hand. They had a big share directory. They had different versions of stuff uh, for um, just organized in no particular way. They had lots of mistakes made in deployment, and those were very expensive, very difficult for them to fix. So they took a look at universal packages, and it kind of forced them to rethink the way they were doing everything. Um, it streamlined their whole process for doing it. They, make, they made their own custom package schema to define a set of additional properties that they would add to all their packages. So they kind of created their own uh, custom package format based on top of UPAC, and that's exactly what we had in mind with this. Uh, packages get published to ProGit by, specifically by the people that make the content, uh, the people that put these images together and so on. They are then, in there they can be tested and reviewed individually. Um, technicians who assemble this stuff in the field, all they have to do is point this internal package manager they built to a ProGit feed, or even an offline version, and just pull in the right versions of everything. Uh, updating is really simple, just like that too. Uh, this is kind of what their, what their universal, or what their uh, package manager that their technicians use looks like. Uh, you can kind of see it's the same idea as our software. It's a little more rough because it's internal, but they're even using Icon, which is kind of neat. Um, and this has been, a, they've told us that this has been kind of a game changer for them, and it's been huge. It was one of the things that actually convinced me that this was actually, yeah, this is actually something that's really useful. Um, well, I'm going to move again to us for another study of these. Uh, the Anito Hub, it's our uh, kind of our new installer, our new take on product installation. We've always had installers, but this one was built to install and kind of maintain each product um, a little bit more. It's, it's, the way it works is kind of similar to Visual Studio's installer now in that it lists available stuff you can install and it allows you to update from there. Uh, it also does uninstallation, some configuration. But the key thing is that it downloads and installs products itself. Uh, before that, well, we didn't really have this product before that, but our old installers, they were built separately. They were built as their own applications. They were all independently versioned, but they would only work with a specific version of one of our released products. We didn't really have a way to distribute a pre-release installer. We had like this beta flag that we could set, but all that did was determine how it showed up on our website. All it ended up doing was confusing a lot of people in the end. Um, we relied entirely on the Windows registry or MSI to determine whether something was installed or not. I mean, that's fine, you have to use something to determine that, but if anything goes wrong with those, then they can be very, very difficult to fix. Uh, of course, I should say we still actually do distribute this. Uh, we didn't want to force people to go to a new installation experience, but, um, you know, John already talked about legacy software, right? so. Uh, so the new approach was to kind of treat our products as packages, which is a little bit out of the normal use case for because our, our products are kind of monoliths. I mean, they're these, if you look at them, they're these big installable apps that are, that are officially released and downloadable. But inside, there's really just three components. There's a website, there's a Windows service, and there's some database, some SQL server scripts that need to be run. We, all we really did is bundle those into a universal package. We use the universal packaging version for the release number. And we also bundle an install script in there. And the install script runs using our other tool I'll talk about a little bit later called ROM. It's recorded in the universal package registry rather than just one of the other places. Uh, of course, uh, nothing's perfect. Uh, we have bugs just like anybody else sometimes. And if an install fails, this can also get something written to it that shouldn't. But the benefit of this is at least, it's all documented, it's very simple. We or even an end user can go in and fix this if something goes wrong. 
Uh, that's what the Anita Hub looks like. It's pretty simple, just products and versions. I mean, it looks simple. It's actually very complicated, but uh, so really, what are you getting out of your deck? It's ready-built, off-the-shelf solution for packaging anything, uh, features on demand, uh, anything like that. I mean, maybe you're not. You're probably not a product company, but still, you might be able to benefit from thinking about your software in this way, thinking about it in terms of which parts can be turned into components that can be independently approved and independently verified. It doesn't even have to be just code. It could be resources like in the Silverfit app. You start with, I mean, the best way to, to try to take advantage of this is to actually start with the simpler stuff, the small components. Uh, it can help you move to microservices if that's what you want. This is a great starting point for that. Um, you can, of course, do this without something like universal packages, but this can make it a heck of a lot easier because we've already done a lot of the work in setting up uh, specs for repositories, for packages, for all that stuff. Uh, there's lots of other things you can do that I haven't even gotten into. There is repackaging, which allows you, see normally we say that a package is immutable. You're never supposed to change it once it's built. And that's kind of an important feature because you want to make sure you deploy the same uh, components in the different environments through your pipeline. But what if you have, say, a CI build of something? It gets versioned with a pre-release version number that has the build in it. Well, that package has gone through all its testing environments. It's been deemed good. We want to release it. Well, if the package were truly immutable, then we'd have to build a new package. Instead, we introduced this repackaging, which lets you change the a, a metadata entry, which really we only intended it to be versioned and only for this one situation of changing a pre-release to a release version. But it also adds an audit history to the metadata to say exactly when this was done and the hash before and after of what happened. So you always get that traceability back to the very first uh, original build everything came from, original git commit, anything like that. Uh, there's also virtual packages, which is really just the manifest file, but it points to one or more other universal packages. And as it's downloaded from a feed, it gets uh, realized. It gets built as you download it. That can be useful for very large ones to try to, to say you have lots of resources that go into one logical package. Well, you don't have to build all this duplicative stuff. You can just uh, make one as a container package that points to other ones. And romp. That is basically the, uh, build, or the Buildmaster Otter execution engine, the things that runs the deployment plans in there as a command line tool. And that works with universal packages that have content and a special install, uninstall, Otter script file in it. Uh, that's what we use for Anita Hub. It's kind of outside of that. It's kind of an experimental tool. We have it on our website, but we don't really actively push people to use it. Some have found it useful besides us anyway. Uh, it's why I consider it one of the advanced things. Uh, well, what's coming next? Uh, package schemas. That's something a lot of people have asked for. A way to define what custom fields your use case for these requires. A formal way to do it. That's something we're definitely working on. It's going to be coming soon. Uh, repackaging inside Proget so you don't have to download the whole thing and then change the version number and then push it back up if you want it ready to release it. That's more of an optimization, but that's coming soon, too. Uh, otherwise, uh, our features for this pretty much come from what people want. Um, I mean, we're at a place now where it meets our needs pretty well. But we're always hearing from people about what they want to do with it. And we, I mean, most of this is open source. All the specs are open source. All the tools are open source except for uh, Proget itself. But um, besides that, we welcome any kind of contributions or suggestions to this. So I guess that about covers it. So, yep, Mark. Revert, um, is it, the repackaging is the yeah. one I know of that. Uh, yeah, repackaging. 
Yeah. What's the gist of that? Well, um, basically it's just you take, the idea is that you have a pre-release version, you want to make it released. You want to get rid of the pre-release part of the version of it. Um, that would normally be considered changing the package, which by itself is not necessarily good because you do that, your packages then have a different hash signature. You can't trace any later issues back to that original build it came from unless you include that information somehow. Uh, this kind of just formalizes a way to do that within the package itself. It adds into that upack.json file a repackage history, all the stuff that was changed, uh, when it was changed, uh, signatures of the file and all that, just so even when something like this happens, you can always trace it back to where it originally came from. Is that? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You know, one thing I wanted to point out, uh, our user Silverfit mm -hmm. just wanted to, to comment the reason they weren't here presenting this use case themselves is actually they're based out of Germany. <laughs> and our user actually really wanted to, but it's a really long voyage over, over here. <laughs> uh, so he yeah. provided us permission to kind of tell the yeah. story for us. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you much. Thank you. Thank you.